everybody. My name is Matt Clayton. I'm one of the servants here at Sports Med. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so first off, I want to welcome everyone here. Uh, thank you for deciding to spend your time with us this morning. Um, this is our first patient education seminar. We hope to start to make this a quarterly event, We're basically discussing a new topic each quarter. So the first one is obviously knee pain. Next quarter will be shoulder pain. So um, if your shoulder is hurting as well, I think about coming back uh, maybe sometime around December. But uh, we'll go ahead and get started today. So we're going to be discussing the causes and treatments for chronic knee pain. <clears throat> Quickly run through the agenda. So I'm going to give a quick basic anatomy talk. It's kind of important to uh, really understand what we're going to be talking about the rest of the day by hammering through the basic anatomy. Then we're going to go over the common causes of knee pain and non-surgical treatment options. Um, we'll discuss arthroscopic knee surgery. And then we're going to talk about a new technology called cold RFA have a quick discussion of uh, physical therapy for chronic knee pain. Then we'll have a little break uh, with some refreshments. may have a, a patient testimonial or two. We'll, we'll see if uh, uh, those folks show up. Um, then we're going to talk about uh, partial knee replacement and cartilage restoration and finally finish with the discussion of total knee replacement <coughs> surgery and then have a time for questions at the end. Um, so before I get into my talk, I'll uh, tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a local boy. I uh, grew up down the street in New Hope. Graduated from there in 2000, so I'm still a proud New Hope Indian. Um, from there, I went to Birmingham Southern for undergrad. I uh, stayed in Birmingham for my medical school at UAB. And then I got shipped off uh, up north to Ohio, uh, where I did my general orthopedic residency at Mount Carmel Medical Center. And finally, got to work my way back down south uh, for my fellowship, which is just an additional year of kind of subspecialty training. Uh, I did that in Nashville, Tennessee, at the Southern Joint Replacement Institute. So as the name kind of implies, I'm a joint replacement surgeon, that's about 80 to 90 percent of my practice. And I've been here at Sports Med uh, for about the past year, a little over a year. So with uh, that behind us, let's uh, talk a little bit about knee anatomy. So the knee itself is the largest joint in the human body. Um, it's considered by quite a few folks to be really the most complex. It has a very complex motion to it. It enables hinge and rotating movements between the thigh and the lower leg. It consists of four main bones, so the illustration here uh, that you see, the femur of the thigh bone is above the knee, the shin bone and the tibia is below the knee joint, and then there's the kneecap, which we refer to as the patella, and the fibula, which is a small bone on the outside of the lower leg. And so this is looking at the knee from the front. This is simply a view of the knee from the side. And so again, you see the femur articulating or meeting the tibia at the knee joint, the fibula somewhat in the back, and the kneecap of the patella is so these bones are covered by cartilage on their ends. It's called hyalin or articular cartilage. The word hyalin comes from the Greek word for glass, hyali. Uh, so that does tell you a little bit about the cartilage in that it's very slick and shiny like glass. And it has two primary functions to allow smooth motion and absorb shock uh, as we're walking and running. And so this is a picture of the end of a cadaveric specimen. And so you can see that it has a very smooth, shiny uh, cartilage. <coughs> So this flat portion here is healthy cartilage, and the portion up top here and here are somewhat arthritic. You can see that redness and inflammation starting to uh, come into the arthritic portion of the knee. So cartilage itself has a very poor blood supply, and it actually receives most of its nutrients through the joint fluid. And so because of this poor bl uh, blood supply, it has extremely limited healing potential. And so when it's injured, it doesn't heal with new hyaline cartilage, but it actually forms something called fiber cartilage. So if you have an injury to the knee, this fiber cartilage is more roughened, it's not as smooth, and it can lead to arthritis. So the hyaline cartilage is not the only type of cartilage that's in your knee. There's also something called a meniscus. And this is just a simple C-shaped cartilage ring, and there's one on the inside of the knee that we refer to as the medial meniscus, and one on the outside of the knee that we refer to as the lateral meniscus triangular cross section and it has two main functions. It distributes pressure throughout the joint as we walk and it does provide some stability during motion. And so the top image here is just looking straight down onto the tibia and so you can see the medial meniscus here and the lateral meniscus on the outside sitting above the fibula. <laughs> and the other image on the uh, lower there is actually an arthroscopic image that you see during the uh, knee surgery. And so the tibia is on the bottom, it's nice and flat. You can see the round finger up top. And then this triangular meniscus in between. The meniscus itself also has a very poor blood supply. 
all the blood has to come from the outside in. And so this top image here shows this triangular shape meniscus with a blood supply on the outside but very little blood flow on the inside of it. So if you have any type of a tear here on the inside, there is very little healing potential and that really dictates how we're able to treat these surgically as we'll talk about a little bit later. So the ligaments are the uh, support structures for the knee. They're short, tough bands of connective tissue that connect bones to bones. So it's important to remember for the meniscus, for the ligament, it's bone to bone. There are four main ligaments in the knee. The medial collateral <coughs> ligament is on the inside of the knee. So it's here, remember the fibula is on the outside. That's an easy way for you to kind of orient yourself when you're looking at these images. The MCL is on the inside of the knee, and it helps to stabilize the knee from going to a knock knee type of position. The lateral collateral ligament is on the outside of the knee. It goes from the femur down to the fibula, and it stabilizes the knee from being in a more of a bow leg type position. So if you can imagine the MCL on this knee here is stretched out on the inside, and this is what we call a valgus position, meaning a knock knee position. This is a normal alignment of the knee, it's neutral, where both ligaments are normally tensioned. In a varus or a bow legged knee, the lateral collateral ligament is stretched out there. Two other ligaments are the anterior cruciate and the posterior cruciate ligament. Uh, these are more kind of on the inside of the knee joint itself. Uh, they actually cross one another. And so when you look at it in a cross section, say if the, if the knee were kind of just cut longitudinally here, um, the ACL goes from the back of the thigh bone to the front of the, the tibia. The PCL goes from the front of thigh bone, femur, to the back of the tibia. And so these ligaments provide stability in a front to back portion <coughs> of the tibia. And this is usually what you hear about being injured in sports injuries, soccer players, football players. Um, Dr. Franklin will talk with you about those injuries in just a minute. There are two major muscle groups that help control the knee. These are the quadriceps muscles and the hamstrings muscles. Uh, there are more muscles that actually cross the joint, but these are the two main muscles, muscle groups that move the knee. The quadriceps are in front of the thigh, it's the major muscle group in the front, and the hamstrings are in the back. So when the quadricep muscle fires or shortens, it helps to straighten the knee. The hamstring muscle helps to bend the knee. And so quadriceps are here on the left, shows it shortening through the patella and straightening the knee. Hamstrings are on the right, when it shortens, it simply bends the knee, flexes it. So the muscles are attached to bones, by tendons. Um, so remember, ligament, bone to bone, tendons are muscle to bone. It's just a very simple way to remember it. A uh, number of tendons actually cross the knee. Um, all of these things can kind of become inflamed and painful. The quadriceps uh, mechanism goes from the quad, which is in the front, connects to the patella, and then goes down to the tibia. You see a nice illustration of that here, looking from the side and then from the front. The hamstring simply runs in the back. This is actually an illustration of a little bit of inflammation that you can get in the hamstring's tendons. Again, when they shorten, they flex. So you just add skin. You've got the whole knee. This was me yesterday morning. <laughs> pardon, pardon the mankini there. But, um, and I think uh, we're going to go ahead and try to move forward. Uh, Dr. Brett Franklin is going to be giving our next talk. <laughs> <laughs> so this is going to be the common causes of knee uh, pain and non-operative treatments. <coughs> Thank you. Good morning. How's everybody today? I see a lot of familiar faces, which is good and bad. Uh, it's nice to see familiar faces. We don't want to see you here. We don't want to see you at Publix or golf courses, things like that, because you're hopefully doing really well. Uh, my name is Brett Franklin, excuse me, as Matt uh, mentioned. I'm from Huntsville as well, went to Grissom High School, graduated in 1995. Uh, my wife and I uh, did uh, medical school in uh, Mobile, uh, South Carolina for uh, orthopedic residency, and did a sports medicine fellowship up there as well. We moved back to the Huntsville area in 2009, so going on, starting my eighth year back here at Sports Med, it's been great, learned a lot, and met a lot of great people. I've been assigned the task or get the privilege to talk about uh, some common uh, causes of knee pain and uh, non-surgical treatment options uh, for, those, for those entities. So 
So here we go. Let's see if I can figure out how to make this work. So common causes of knee pain, they can be divided into traumatic causes, injuries, or non-traumatic causes. So traumatic causes, which we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on, would be things like uh, fractures or broken bones, where someone might have a fall. Um, Matt touched on ligament injuries, the ACL ligament, PCL, those can all be injured. Typically higher energy type injuries, sports injuries, soccer, basketball, car wrecks, motorcycle wrecks, things like that. Hopefully we're never going to see uh, any of you with those. Cartilage injuries, so uh, Matt did a great job touching on the different types of cartilage. The hyaline cartilage that covers our bone and the meniscus injuries are extremely common. Some non-traumatic causes would be things like overuse syndromes like tendonitis quadriceps or patellar tendonitis, that probably don't need that. Uh, bursitis, you may have heard of that term. Bursa are these small sacs of fluid around our joint that can become inflamed. And then we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about degenerative conditions, osteoarthritis, uh, and chondro a big fancy million dollar medical word, chondromalacia. There'll be a test later if you can pronounce it. So traumatic injuries, just to touch briefly, uh, the <coughs> common bones around the knee that can be broken, the patella or kneecap. Distal femur fractures, so at the end of the thigh bone, we broke in many ways. And then tibial plateau, or the top part of the tibia, we call those plateau fractures. And how we determine whether or not to operate or not operate depends on multiple factors. Patient activity, patient health, the pattern or how the fracture occurred, is can it be you know, treated with a cast or a brace. So uh, multiple factors, so too much information or discussion for today's uh, in regards to those. Ligament injuries, the famous one that gets all the attention on ESPN would be the ACL or anterior cruciate ligament injury. It's a very common sports injury. It usually occurs with a non-contact type injury. Somebody plants their foot, twists, they hear a pop or a sudden stop. It happens much more frequently in females than males. You may have children or grandchildren or may have had an ACL injury, it's quite common. Patients come in and tell us they felt a pop in their knee. Their knee blows up from swelling, from blood, it gets very swollen. And then afterwards, they have uh, symptoms of instability or their knee gives way. They just don't trust it. And whether or not we treat it, again, multiple factors uh, uh, involved. Patient activity, their age, um, their requirements of activity. Do they ski, do they golf, or do they just walk? A lot of them can be managed non-surgically. Uh, Dr. Moore is going to go into more treatment about surgical discussion. So this is just a picture of how it occurs. Uh, typically, a young lady comes down, their knee bends in, they feel a pop. This is the inside of the knee. The ligament is torn. There should be a nice big broad band here. And then on something called an MRI study, we look and see that the fibers of the ACL have been torn. Talking about injuries to the cartilage of the knee, there can be articular cartilage or that hyaline type injury. Those typically happen in a fall or they can be repetitive in nature. Uh, as we get older, the incidence of articular cartilage injuries, they just happen. People will come into the office and say their knee's painful, it swells, or we talk about mechanical symptoms can occur. That's things like catching, popping, locking, their knee gives way. Again, they may not trust it. That can all be a sign of damage to the hyaline cartilage or the joint or articular cartilage you see exposed bone. In <coughs> our study, uh, doctors are going to look for this edema or fluid in the bone and see that the cartilage is disrupted on the knee. <coughs> Inside the knee joint, we'll see fraying or crab meat or the shag carpet turn, so that cartilage does not look pretty and shiny like the picture Dr. Clayton just showed a minute ago. As you mentioned, these can be tough to treat because cartilage does not have a good blood supply, so it doesn't have the ability to heal on its own, except in an extremely young population, 10-year-olds, uh, 12-year-olds, teenagers. A lot of times these injuries can be managed non-surgically with activity modification, rest, something called, I'm going to put NSAIDs, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, so that'll be throughout our talks. NSAIDs are Aleve, Motrin, Celebrex, Mobic, these types of medications. Those fall into a category called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. You can inject them with cortisone to relieve pain, or there's multiple uh, surgical options, which again, Dr. Moore is going to cover more in detail. We can go clean them up, we can try to fix them in certain patients, we can replace cartilage, or we can do a joint replacement, which again will be a large part of today's discussion. The meniscus tears, we mentioned the meniscus tissue, those are those bumper pad cushion cartilage Dr. Clayton mentioned. Those can be torn. Uh, they can occur in young folks with sports injuries, twisting or pivoting of their knee. And older folks, myself included, oftentimes it does not require an injury at all. People tell us, you know, I went down to tie my shoe, felt the pop, and it tore. So quite a bit uh, as we get 40, 50, 60 and above, people will come in with meniscus tears and they don't recall ever injuring it because it doesn't take much to injure it. It becomes fragile as we get 
Uh, patients will typically have pain, they'll have swelling, and they'll have again those mechanical symptoms of catching, popping, clicking, blocking, their knee gives way. This is what it looks like when we go look inside the knee. Bright, shiny cartilage on the thigh bone, shin bone, and you see the sprayed, torn bumper pad cushion on these images below. Uh, treatment, we try to manage them if we can non-surgically. Bracing, medicines, therapy to get the knee strong, rest. Many times these have to be cleaned up or uh, torn portion removed because again, they just won't heal. Then we go from non-traumatic, excuse me, from traumatic to non-traumatic tight knee injuries or sources of knee pain. Common uh, overuse injuries that we see in the office include running, jumping, cycling. Those can cause inflammation or irritation of the structures Matt mentioned, the patellar tendon and quadriceps tendon. We'll see tendonitis very frequently. We'll see pain around the iliotibial band, which is a broad band of tissue we all have on the outside of our thigh. That's called iliotibial band syndrome. We'll see that in repetitive athletes. And then we'll also see pain in work-related type activities where people are on their feet all day or doing some type of repetitive activity that cause irritation and inflammation. Uh, then we see things like degenerative conditions, patellofemoral pain, that means kneecap or anterior knee pain, and chondromalacia patella, that term we mentioned chondromalacia inflammation or degradation of the cartilage in the knee. Osteoarthritis is wear and tear. Osteo means bone, arthritis means joint inflammation, itis means inflammation. When we use that term osteoarthritis, we mean wear and tear of the cartilage on the bone. Other degenerative conditions are, again, bursitis. We see bursitis or this inflammation of this uh, tissue around our tendons in several areas. One is called the pre-patellar area. That's the front of your kneecap. Or your pes bursa. Pes means chicken feet or bird feet, and that's where your hamstrings attach on the inside of your knee, a very common place we see patients complain of pain. We'll see other things that cause pain, like baker cysts. You may have heard of a baker cyst or a knee cyst. That's a painful swelling area in the back of the knee that comes from excess fluid, trying to find a place to escape. What we call those popliteal cysts or baker cysts. We'll touch on some of these things. So tendonitis. Tendonitis is just simply inflammation of a tendon. The three most common places, again, we see are the patellar tendon, that's the kneecap tendon above the, uh, up to below your kneecap, and then quadriceps tendonitis is where your quadriceps muscles attach to the tendon. It doesn't appear to me that any of these people in this picture have patellar quadriceps tendonitis. And I'm not sure Michael Jordan ever had patellar quadriceps tendonitis, but they're great pictures of jumping, it looks like they're having a lot of fun. Thankfully, uh, tendonitis, 99.9% .9 of the time, requires very simple things. Take away what you're doing. So rest with running, I hate to hear that. Uh, rice, you all may have heard of the rice therapy. Rest, ice, compression, elevation. So that oftentimes manages these uh, sources of pain. If we can't manage it with that, we'll often send them to Tommy, our physical therapist, and he'll work his magic with uh, ultrasound, stretching, strengthening, correcting any muscle imbalances that might be leading to the problem. And then we uh, often prescribe NSAIDs, or again, they'll leave Motrin. And then bracing, we can use different braces to take tension off these tendons to relieve pain. One of the common ones we use is a little band called a Showpat strap. Iliotibial band syndrome we see frequently in our runners and cyclists. This is from repetitive motion of this tissue called the iliotibial band. As it rubs over a bone bump we all have on the outside of our thigh bone called the lateral epicondyle. That repetitive motion acts like a piece of sandpaper and it'll become a very painful hot spot Again, thankfully often treated without surgery, simply modify their activities, correct any muscle imbalances, stretch, medications. Occasionally we'll do corticosteroid or uh, cortisone or steroid shots in that area to relieve pain. I've been through that, it's a lot of fun. Thank you, Dr. Moore. <laughs> he did a great job. He was treating me like a gentle baby. So going on to this uh, million dollar word, chondromalacia patella. We see this, all see this very frequently in our practices. Uh, anterior knee pain or chondromalacia patella or patellofemoral pain or patellofemoral syndrome. There are all these terms we use to describe that somebody's kneecap is not happy. It's much more common in females than males. Patients will come in and tell us that their knee crunches or has rice krispies as their knee goes up and down. They tend to have difficulty going up and down stairs getting up out of a chair, getting off of a commode, um, and if they sit in the front of the plane too long, the front of their knee just aches. So we use that term chondromalacia patella very frequently. Um, basically what's happening, as you can see in these images, 
instead of having a nice joint space between the kneecap and the thigh bone, the joint gets a little narrow, the cartilage gets inflamed. When we look inside a knee, we see instead of this nice, normal, healthy cartilage on the kneecap, we see this frayed kind of roughing cartilage. Thankfully, most of this is not uh, a surgical problem. We can get people better with modifying what they're doing, losing weight helps, uh, an osteroidal anti-inflammatory <coughs> medicines, injections are used routinely. Going on to osteoarthritis, as uh, Dr. Clayton uh, mentioned, osteoarthritis is a large part of what we're going to talk about today. It's very frequent. 7.7 um, .7 million uh, U.S. citizens will be diagnosed and treated per year for osteoarthritis in the knee. That's a lot of people. Again, when we say osteoarthritis, there's, that can mean a lot of things, but what we're trying to uh, convey is that we're talking about breakdown, wear and tear of the articular cartilage or the hyaluronic part, island cartilage on the bone. Again, as Dr. Clayton mentioned, this tissue cannot regenerate itself because it has extremely <coughs> poor blood supply. The cause is, you know, people say, why did I get arthritis? Well, I tell people you got it from your parents because the primary cause of arthritis is genetic. Other things that can cause it, injury when you're younger, weight issues, alignment, does a knee, as Dr. Clay mentioned, varus and valgus, that malalignment of the knee will cause extra wear. And then there's some question, you know, does activity really lead to arthritis? You know, does somebody that runs 100 miles a week long-term develop arthritis? There's really not a lot of studies or science that say that is the culprit. For somebody who works in a uh, factory all their life and stands on concrete, does that truly lead to arthritis? It might, but probably those things up above were the real issue that caused it. Osteoarthritis causes lots of symptoms, primarily pain. People don't like how their knee feels. They say it's stiff. It's often stiff in the morning when they sit in a car or a chair or a moving chair a long time. It'll take them a minute to get up and get going. That's called startup pain. People with arthritis, as they get moving because the blood fluid starts flowing, will feel a little bit better typically. Again, the knee won't move as well. It'll swell intermittently, and we get this thing called crepidence. That's that rough cartilage grinding, sensation of grinding in the knee. How do we work patients up for osteoarthritis? Quite frankly, all you really need is to ask them a few questions and do a physical exam. 99% of the time, we can diagnose people with arthritis through three or four questions and examining their knee. Of course, we're gonna x-ray it to see what it looks like. This is a nice comparison knee. This young person has a really, really healthy left knee. We see lots of space, normal alignment between the thigh bone and shin bone. Unfortunately, their right knee, you see this quote unquote bone on bone arthritis. You may have heard that term. That's simply saying the cartilage is worn out and instead of the cushion being there, we have bone touching bone. So painful right knee, stiff right knee, very healthy left knee. Um, people come to us oftentimes with an MRI study on a knee like this. And quite frankly, we don't need it. You know, this x-ray tells us everything we need. An MRI study, a magnetic resonance imaging is an expensive test that often doesn't really give us value. Sometimes we'll get it if we're concerned more about a meniscus tear, but for arthritis such as this, MRI is questionable value. And sometimes there may be weird causes other than just wear and tear. Things like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, psoriatic arthritis, gout can cause joint degeneration, etc. There's multiple, multiple entities that can cause joint degeneration that we don't have time to go into. So how do we manage uh, osteoarthritis non-surgically? I like to defer to something called a ladder, ladder treatment. So very rarely does somebody walk in with arthritis and our first answer to them is your only option is a knee replacement. So we use what's called a ladder approach. We start with simple things, go to the next simple thing, go to the next simple thing, and eventually you know, joint replacement may become an option. So least invasive to most invasive. The first trunk of the ladder for uh, treatment of osteoarthritis oftentimes is just simply observation. People may not hurt that much. Uh, one of my uh, attendings and fellowship used to give me that, used to say, little problems get little treatment. Big problems get big treatment. So if somebody comes in and they hurt once or twice a month, their knee sore for a day, the answer for that may be simply, let's just observe it. You know, not necessarily put them on medicines, do injections, do bracing, do therapy, do surgery. So activity modification can often be very beneficial. We talk about exercise for patients with knee arthritis. We can group exercises into knee-friendly type exercises and knee-unfriendly exercises. So things like running, jumping on an arthritic knee may be a little tough, may cause more symptoms than a patient really wants. So we might direct them more towards things like swimming, elliptical, balance classes, cycling is very knee-friendly. We also talk about weight loss as an option for a first run in the latter treatment. It's been looked at, and if you lose uh, uh, one pound of body weight, 
transitions to losing four pounds of force when you're walking because of the way physics and mechanics work. So even just a small amount of weight loss can be very beneficial on taking load off the knee. If that doesn't seem to make people feel better, you go to the second run of the ladder, the second run of the ladder which would include things like medications. Over-the-counter OTC, over-the-counter medicines would be Aleve, Motrin, Ibuprofen, Tylenol. Oftentimes that manages people's symptoms. They can be safe. If it doesn't, then we might look at a prescription medicine. Some of the common ones we all write are things like Mobic or Meloxicam, Celebrex, Ambutone, Relifem. There's a list about a thousand long of anti-inflammatories that would be effective. And it's just a matter of finding one safe. Things like analgesics, so pain relievers, I would suggest with caution. That's not necessarily a route, prescription pain medicines. Sometimes that's what we have to do to keep people happy, or keep their knee happy. But that's a, that's a road you want to go down very carefully. And I just caution you about these medications. <coughs> the most common problem patients have with these are uh, gastrointestinal risk, so reflux, um, ulcers. We have to be very careful with those. So just as a uh, advisory to you, if you want to consider starting this, ask your doctor. Make sure you don't have any reflux disease or ulcer disease because these can certainly irritate the lining of your stomach. The other issue with these types of medicines is cardiac risk. So being careful if you have a heart history, uh, congestive heart failure, AFib, certain uh, medications you might be on would be contraindicated or we at least need counseling about starting these types of medicines. Uh, there's a lot of uh, interest in things like glucosamine chondroitin, something I call nutraceuticals or vitamin supplements. You may all have heard of glucosamine and chondroitin. These are medications that you can take. Glucosamine and chondroitin are normal occurring proteins in our cartilage. <coughs> they go down with arthritis. And the idea behind these is you take a pill that goes into your cartilage and kind of builds it back up. They can be effective. There's not a lot of great research that they work, but some patients swear by them, and we go, great, keep taking them. Things like MSM or fish oil, you may have heard of these. My one caution to you about vitamins and supplements is that keep in mind these are not FDA regulated medicines, so you don't know what's in each bottle. If you do try them, I recommend getting a trusted name, big brand, because really it's not, these medicines aren't regulated what's put in each pill, okay? So that's just a little caution to you. Another option on the second rung ladder for treatment would be something called a motor bracing. I'm sorry, my picture got cut off. This beautiful young lady is playing golf in something called an unloader brace. An unloader brace is a brace that we put on knees. The idea is it unloads or takes pressure off the damaged part of the knee, most typically the inside of the knee. So, sorry my picture did not come through. I don't know how that changed. But these can be very effective for people as they walk and exercise or stand or shop or whatever. <coughs> that they take pressure off the bad part of the knee, again, hopefully avoiding surgery. What I would consider, the, so if those don't work, medicines, bracing, exercise, the third run of the ladder, we start talking about injections. And there's two broad categories of injections we use for knee arthritis. One is a steroid, or corticosteroid injection. There's multiple types that we use for that. The idea of these simply treat inflammation. So steroid is an anti-inflammatory. These can be very effective for quick relief if somebody has sharp pain from arthritis. They don't improve cartilage. They don't change the long-term you know, story of the knee, but they can give people quite a bit of relief. Another option that's been out probably 15, 20 years are these injections called visco supplementation or hyaluronic acid, that hyalur hyaluronic, hyla, joint cartilage. There's several brands on the market. I listed a few, but these injections, some of you may have had, uh, are a series or a one-time injection of Vaseline. So this stuff that we inject is thick, gelatinous, hyaluronic acid. It acts like grease or cushions in the knee. Hyalin is an anti-inflammatory protein. So the idea is with arthritis, your hyaluronic level of acid is decreased and we're trying to build it back up, treat inflammation, and put some type of mechanical cushion into a knee joint. More recently, there are things called stem cells. You may all have heard of stem cells. So stem cells is the catch, uh, exciting word. Stem cells, the idea is we're taking cells that have not differentiated or become a type of cell, and somehow we're trying to direct them to become cartilage cells to replace damaged cartilage. Stem cells or platelet-rich plasma, PRP, are some new cutting edge, not approved by insurance, not really proven to work yet, things that are out there that are being tried. I would tell you, uh, I put three question marks right there. Right now, we're really not sure of the future of those. Uh, it's exciting to think about, but right now, they're really not in broad practice for treatment of arthritis. 
And of course, the final rung of the ladder, so if all else fails, if we can't get people better, then we can talk about surgical options. Whether we go in and try to clean up uh, an art, uh, degenerative knee, remove torn damaged cartilage, do some type of cartilage replacement surgery, which I'll touch on later, partial knee replacements, if only one uh, portion of the knee is damaged, we can partially replace a knee. And if all else fails, then a total knee replacement, which Dr. Clayton's going to touch on, uh, would be options. I thank you for your time and uh, open the floor for any questions, discussions that uh, you guys may have. Yes, ma'am. Um, partial knee replacement versus total. Sure. Um, I just have one spot. Okay. Maybe over there. Would you determine that by MRI and x ray ability to do the whole joint, or would it be by symptoms? It would be all of the above. So, yeah, if somebody isolates, I'm going to touch on that later, so I'll briefly answer that. Correct, yes, x rays, <coughs> MRI, does the rest of the knee look involved, patient's activity level, their demands, do we think they're going to need another knee replacement down the road? There are multiple data points for a uh, piece of information that we can include. And then the discussion of the patient, what their desires are. Uh, a lot of people don't want a knee replacement, or they go, I don't want to come back in five years and have this done again. So there's a lot of lot of pieces of information uh, to go into that decision. Great question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, curious what you make of the rooster comb injection. Yes, ma'am. So that so rooster comb. She said, "What do I make of rooster comb injections? Rooster comb injections. That's a um, term for those gel injections we mentioned, hyaluronic acid injections, or visco supplementation. One of the brands send this." Originally, they were one of the first ones to make those injections. They derive the hyaluronic acid from rooster combs because it's the same protein. So people come in all the time and say, Doc, my friend had the rooster comb injections. I like the rooster comb injections. <coughs> and those are SynDisc injections. More recently, I would tell you the trend is towards synthetic <coughs> versions. So there's multiple. Um, one of the concerns about rooster comb injections is reactions to them. People with chicken allergies, egg allergies, bird allergies, it happens. Uh, there can also be some reactions called pseudosepsis. Pseudo means fake, sepsis means infection. So some of those injection brands uh, in the past have had some reactions within the knee that look like an ugly infected knee. Um, it's a good product. I'm not, uh, not send this, which comes with a good product, we use them. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama has actually made that their first choice recently. So we do more and more of them. But there are synthetic versions for people who we don't think that's a great option or they're just not comfortable with it. That's a great question. Did the HA um, did it eliminate pain? Did it last for a while? Did it recover under the insurance? Yes, and yes. Does it replace the cartilage to a certain extent? No. So, yes, 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 no. So, his questions were Does it relieve pain? We sure hope so. Uh, your second question was How long does it last? How long does it last? So, insurance, everybody's different. Some people it works real well. Ideally, it would last six months or more because that's how often insurance uh, companies currently will uh, pay for it. So pay for it's an issue. One of your questions was, does insurance pay for it? And the answer is yes. Um, certain insurance companies have a first choice brand that they would like us to, or tell us, quite frankly, tell us to use. So again, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama has made Sendus their first choice. So we're required to use it in those patients. Medicare, United, Cigna have lots of, have other options available. Did I cover all of the questions? There was one more, I think. Bone to bone type thing when you got that really helps. And really, really that can go to uh, the place. Tough question. Um, the answer is it can help. I tell patients, you know, the idea if your car has 500,000 miles on it, changing oil may not give you a new engine. So when it becomes bone on bone, the idea that an injection is going to work as well as somebody who has less arthritis, in my mind, makes sense, right? So the more severe the arthritis, the less likely these things are going to work. However, we still try them a lot, okay? So a lot of times, thankfully, uh, you know, knee arthritis, I tell people, thankfully is not cancer, it's not a heart attack, it's not an emergency. I don't see a downside in trying all these things if a patient desires. If a patient's been in and said, I've tried all those, doc, I still hurt, then we get to Dr. Clayton's discussion on the request. One more, question back there? Do the steroid injections have an effect on Baker's cysts, or is it just for the arthritis? No, it certainly can help Baker's cysts as well. So, okay. yeah, the question was, does a cortisone shot help Baker's cysts? They can. Sometimes we would direct, uh, instead of doing that injection just in our office for a Baker's cyst, we might send you somewhere to have a radiologist do it under ultrasound. 
uh, to inject the cyst itself. The cyst is in the back of the knee. I call that tiger country. That's where your blood vessels are, your nerves are, all the dangerous things that we don't want to hit. And it's nice sometimes to have a radiologist direct their injection for those, okay? Thank you. Everyone move on, Jack Moore and I also grew up in Huntsville and um, went to Madison County, so we have a great a few high schools here. Um, so uh, my talk is going to be talking about operative treatment of common knee injuries, uh, arthroscopic. We're going to let Dr. Clayton touch more on the knee replacement surgery, but there's some real common things that, you, that you'll see uh, with regard to the treatment of knee injuries. Uh, knee pain is the most common reason that people seek out their doctor primary care for as far as musculoskeletal. The most common complaint in America is knee pain. And that's probably the most common thing that we see as well day to day. Um, and of course, Dr. Clayton did really good job covering the anatomy. I'm not gonna go back too much into that other than uh, primarily what we're gonna be focusing on in this treatment is patellofemoral anterior knee pain or stability of that joint. Uh, the ligament structures, the menisci, and we'll touch a little bit on condomalation, the, the softening or degenerative process of that hyaline cartilage. And then Dr. Franklin's gonna come back and talk about some of the restor restorative surgical treatments of that articular cartilage as well. So we'll cover that a little later. Um, as he mentioned, uh, as Dr. Clayton mentioned, the ligaments are bone to bone stability, uh, tendons are muscle to bone, and then of course the, the two types of cartilage being the hyaline, which is the weight bearing cartilage, that glassy cartilage is smooth. And then the menisci, uh, or meniscus, is that circular O-ring appearing uh, cartilage. It, it not only helps with stability and pivoting, but also deepens the articular surface, so it gives you some, uh, it does help in the weight bearing surface of the knee as well. Um, I'm, I'm gonna do this based sort of in a different way, just cover it as a, as a case, you know, case by case, and this is what we would see presenting to our office almost daily. Uh, would be uh, the first one would be in a 17 year old playing football uh, he had a twisting injury and has some mild to moderate swelling uh, he's hurting over the lateral aspect of his knee and he complains of something catching in the knee when he bends and straightens his knee uh, this can hurt with pivoting and bending and occasionally he may feel like as he steps something's locked in there and people will describe having to work their knee out to get things to feel right and uh, that's that locking symptom is uh, not always present with a meniscal tear, but often they'll, they'll uh, complain of that. This is a, a schematic of a, a common meniscal tear. So this, you, you may be able to see, um, sorry, you may be able to see the tear on the back rim. It looks like a windshield wiper on this type tear. It's called an oblique tear. There's different types of tear in the meniscus, and this determines how we treat these. Uh, this particular tear would be treated by just trimming out that flap and preserving the outer uh, portion of the meniscus. As Dr. Clayton mentioned, the blood supply comes in from the outside in. So only those very peripheral tears toward the outside of the knee have the blood supply to heal. So in general, the inner margin tears like you see on this picture are not going to heal. There's no blood supply to heal. So the, the option is what we call a partial meniscectomy, which means we remove that flap that's torn and try to create a contour that provides that stability. Most studies would say that if you can preserve the outer 50 to 60% of your meniscus, that you can have normal mechanical function. Uh, most less, some deeper tears, you're unable to preserve that much, and of course that can lead to further accelerated arthritis if you can't preserve that outer rim. Uh, this is a, an MRI scan of a tear, and what you see in that triangular part in the, on the right-hand side of your screen, there's a uh, fluid signal within that triangle. The triangle has been broken as far as the margins, and you see a fluid within the knee. 
this would be pretty consistent with a, a cleavage type of tear, which means it, it, it uh, actually tears into the substance of the meniscus. Um, certain, not a very detailed slide, but surgery basically for meniscus tears is the primary treatment. Uh, most of the time, there'll be occasions where there's a small meniscal tear, and if someone's asymptomatic, I, I think most of us agree we don't try to create pain when there's no pain. So if someone has a meniscus tear, a lot of times you'll have a person show up with an MRI and says, doctor says, I, my family doctor said I have a meniscal tear, I need to have surgery, or and they may not be hurting. And so there's times where, where someone with a moderate to mild activity level is not having pain, and certainly don't believe in operating on someone who's not hurting. But the majority of times when there's a meniscal tear, there's pain occurring. Uh, they can go through cycles where that windshield wiper tear is tucked out of the way as if your windshield wiper would be when it's off. And those can be pain-free for several weeks. And then if you step off of a curb or out of your car in an awkward direction, that piece flips into the joint. Of course, that creates symptoms of catching. And the next step in that situation is the, the surgery, which we do through an arthroscopy. Uh, we Generally, the majority of the tears are trimmed out, like the partial meniscectomy. Those outer tears will do meniscal repairs on if they have blood supply uh, to those areas. Uh, these tears can also accompany other injuries. So real common with ACL injuries, you'll see meniscal tears accompanying those uh, ACL and PCL injuries that we'll get into shortly. Uh, <coughs> second real common situation, especially in young females, uh, is patella dislocation or patella instability. And this may, sometimes we'll see a full dislocation, sometimes we'll see someone who has tracking of their kneecap or patella, which is off-center and leading to pain. Uh, ultimately, when we get the proper x-rays and, and scans, we'll see that their alignment is, is uh, off or they may have a uh, underdeveloped groove for their kneecap. So there's different reasons for patella instability. In this case, a 20-year-old who's had some uh, chronic pain uh, and also has had recurrent subluxation, which means slipping of the kneecap or dislocations. Uh, as when the, knee, when the kneecap is in place, very little pain. So you may see a, a girl commonly who's a freshman or sophomore in high school who's had one event and goes two years of playing sports with relative, relatively no symptoms and then has a second event maybe two or three years later. And in general, we, we approach these conservatively. Uh, the, Anatomy, you'll see that there's tendons on both the, the above the patella, which is a quadriceps tendon, and then of course the below the patella is a patella tendon. There's also structures, uh, mu muscles attaching on the inner and outer sides of the knee, and this uh, doesn't have the muscles shown. But our first line of treatment is obviously therapy and strengthening. If you can balance out the muscle pull on the patella, a lot of times this will align the kneecap with, with less pain. Uh, Otherwise, we have to go in and surgically to rearrange or, or reconstruct that uh, alignment. And so, this is an x-ray of a, uh, after a patella dislocation. You can see that <coughs> the patella sits laterally uh, instead of being centered in the groove. And in this case, being a traumatic dislocation, you can actually see a chip of bone uh, on the left-hand side of your screen that's where the patella has chipped off a piece of the groove. And then, of course, a little bit of uh, chip off the side of the kneecap on the right side. So this is a, a pretty traumatic, a more unusual finding would be a, a big loose fragment in the joint. And this was more of a, you would not treat this with just therapy. This was one that would require surgery immediately to address those loose pieces. Uh, this is an MRI of a patella dislocation. You can see uh, a lot of fluid or blood uh, where the, the medial attachment has detached, uh, it's called a retinaculum. You can see the gap where the fluid or blood is protruding and the attachment is that darker structure to the right of the arrow that's shaped like an arch as the retinaculum has been ruptured off of the patella. You can see the, the outer attachment to the patella is intact, that lateral retinaculum. And oftentimes that's a very tight structure in people who have alignment issues. And there's there's been a trend previously of releasing that retinaculum. <coughs> now we, we do usually combine procedures where we reconstruct the ligament on the inner side uh, and then we uh, plus or minus uh, releasing that tighter structure. 
On this patient, you can see that the, the thigh bone, the femur, has very little groove. There's just no trough for that patella. So this person uh, probably had some predisposing uh, uh, anatomic reasons for dislocations, and that would have to be addressed as well.